Welcome, I'm Katherine Myers, Associate Publisher of New Harbinger Publications. And today it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Singer, New York Times bestselling author of The Untethered Soul and The Surrender Experiment, and now The Untethered Soul Guided Journal. Michael will be in conversation with Matthew McKay, who is a clinical psychologist, researcher, and co-director of the Bay Area Trauma Recovery Clinic and publisher at New Harbinger Publications. They will be discussing Michael's spiritual perspectives on psychological struggles, such as grief, anxiety, stress, and anger that so many of us are experiencing in the face of uncertainty and overwhelming change. Let's begin. Thank you, Catherine. Michael, you've helped millions of people with your spiritual teaching and writing, and I'm really looking forward to getting your perspective as we are facing such difficult times. I wanted to start with what so many people are facing, grief. Um, people are struggling with collective grief for what's happening to others, uh, for the people who've lost safety and security, lost a sense of normalcy, and even some who've lost loved ones. And these folks also feel their own serial grief for one thing after another lost in their own lives. And I'm wondering from a spiritual perspective, how can they best deal with this grief? Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Like everything else in life, it depends on what level you want to work. And those of you who know me know I only work at one level, and that is the deeply spiritual, the deeply truth level. It doesn't negate the human level. It incorporates the human level, but it doesn't say that the human level is the only level there is. And so the answer to all of those questions starts with, are you willing to rise above it? Or do you want to be involved in it? So obviously you're a psychologist, you know well that some people want to get, be in their stuff. You know, it's a problem and I need to deal with this. What I like to talk about is to somebody who's saying, I'm having trouble with this, but I don't want to have trouble with this. I, I believe that I, there should be a way that I can deal with this. It's reality. We're supposed to be the highest species on the planet. And the definition Darwin defined the highest the, the evolution of species as adaptability, right? An ability, and forget, don't worry about survival of the fittest, we don't go there, but adaptability, the ability to adapt to reality. We don't control reality. We try and we do some, there's no question we can do some, but here's an example where we can't control this pandemic, right? Individually, we, we can do what we can and we'll talk about that. But there comes a point in one's life, whether it be the pandemic, whether it be relationship problems, whether it be financial problems, where you realize right here, right now, I have to deal with this. It doesn't help if I can't deal with it. When people say, I can't deal with this. Well, if you can't deal with it, then it's not going to do very well <laughs> because you can't deal with it, all right? So you have to start with saying, I want to be able to. I respect the fact that I'm having trouble, right? I have a human side of myself, but I want to, at least I want to be able to evolve enough, grow enough, be strong enough, be clear enough, call it whatever you want, to where I can face this and I can do well with it and now I can do my best. But you have to start by being willing to say, I'm willing to try, I'm willing to do this. My starting point of trying, and I know people can get very mad at me, I'm surprised they don't, all right, is to say I'm sitting on a planet spinning in the middle of nowhere. I am, that's the truth, I'm sorry. I, I hope it doesn't sound cold, because it's called reality. I'm sitting on a tiny little planet spinning around the black empty space, all right? And this is what's going on. There are events going on around me. There are always events going on around me. And from the point of view that I'm sitting on a planet and I'm not going to be here very long, I just came down to visit for 60, 70, 80, 90 years. That's reality also. What do I want to do? What's it going to be like on the planet? And you start by realizing that I live inside myself. I'm in here with my thoughts. I'm in here with my emotions. And then there's a world out there. Those two are only as connected as I decide they are. I don't want to sound teach people to be, be dis disassociated. I'm not talking about that. But if something is going on outside and it's problematic, such as the pandemic, it's not going on inside of me, except that I said it was. If I'm worrying about it, if I'm uptight about it, if I'm creating all kinds of melodrama about it, 
I'm doing that. I have the right to say, oh, there's a pandemic going on. That's unbelievable. Who would think I'd be alive and all Americans are walking around, not all, I wish they were, but walking around with masks on, right? It's an amazing experience. Are you at least willing to step back and appreciate the time you're living in? Because you don't have a choice. Your choice is bother yourself about it or find that there's excitement in it, find that it's unique, find that it's a journey. It's an unbelievable experience. It is an unbelievable experience to go to a grocery store and see everybody wearing masks, all right? Can you at least be willing to accept and honor and respect that you are experiencing something awesome, something unbelievable, something that you never would have expected? That's your starting place. I'm sitting on a planet, smearing in the middle of nowheres, and this is what's going on. Now, there are financial problems. There are relationship problems. The kids are at home. They're hard to deal with, all right? First, you start. Am I okay with that? And you can accept that there's a part of you that's having trouble, but can I be okay with that? Do I want to be okay with that? And you make a game out of it. You make fun out of it. You work with it to where inside your number one responsibility, your number one, is that you're okay inside. Because if you're not okay, then you're not okay. That's by definition. So that's what spirituality says. It says, be okay inside. Now, the question of how, we can talk about that. But I'm telling you, the starting place is you have to be willing to say, I'm willing to try. I'm willing to work with this. I'm willing to say, yes, I can be okay with this. Now help me to do that. But I can't have the discussion. If you want to say, how can you say I'm okay with it? I could never be okay with it. How can you be okay with this? If you start with that position, you've given up. You just basically said, no, I'm not going to be okay. And there is no answer. Maybe psychology has an answer. Uh, spirituality doesn't. Spirituality says the soul is greater than the mind. It is greater than the melodrama. You are in there. You're a beautiful being. A pandemic outside does not make you not a beautiful being. It does not, make, it does not touch your connection to God. It does not touch anything. It just challenges you to be able to be okay or not be okay. So I'll, I'll, I don't want to keep talking, so I'll stop there as a starting position, is are, are the people we're talking to willing to say, I, would, I want to do this, I want to be okay. I want to find it to be an awesome, amazing time to live with all these different changes going on and all these different challenges. I'm, I'm up for the challenge. I'm up for the change. I'm up to try this. Now I'm having trouble. How do I do this? That's a different question then how can I be okay? How could anybody be okay? Fair enough, Matt? Fair enough. And so in the outside world, everything is changing. There's an enormous unpredictability. But inside, I have a choice how I respond to that. And my choice is, do I want to face this challenge? Do I, do I want to accept what's happening and do my very best with it? And the main part of do the best is not outside. If you're, I always use the example, if somebody's in a car accident, but you're afraid of blood, you have no use. You can't help them. Even, even if you knew how, you, you can't do it because you're afraid, all right? So you have to start by being willing to say, I can and will accept reality. Now I may be able to help them or not. That's a different question, right? When you get down to the physical plane. But if you can't start inside, with being willing to try and being willing to have a positive, constructive attitude about it, then you know that nothing good can come out of that. So that's the starting place is, and it's not just, can I accept, right? Can I appreciate? Can I be open to? What words do you want to use, right? Can I realize this is the expression of the universe at this moment? There are hundreds of billions and zillions of other things going on on all the other planets, all the other stars, all the other galaxies. This is the one that's going on right now for me, all right? I love it. Believe it or not, you love it, you honor it, you respect it, you appreciate it, you welcome it. Now go help the person that's bleeding, at least to stand a chance. So the word that comes to me as I'm listening is, is to embrace it. Yeah, totally. Um, well, thank you. I want to talk a little bit about anxiety. Many of my clients are struggling with spiraling anxiety. You know, there's jobs, there's the world the economy, there's political strife. They worry about their own health, about the health of loved ones. And I'm wondering how we can best respond to this uncertainty. 
uh, how can we relate to and understand this uncertainty? Right. It's always going to be the same answer with me. I apologize, right? If you start with the fact this is not about the virus or the pandemic or the economy, it's about me. It's about my spiritual evolution, my growth, right? What a rare opportunity to deal with yourself. You're being forced to deal with yourself, right? We talk about in spirituality, can you handle the changes that happen around you? Usually it's easy, oh yeah, you know, as long as your wife stays and behaves and your children are getting A's, you follow me? As long as it's behaving within a realm of something that you're a comfort zone we talk about, right? As long as within your comfort zone, oh yeah, we're very spiritual, right? Now it's out of your comfort zone. And so we either complain that it's out of my comfort zone or we sit there and say, I don't want to waste this. I don't want to waste one moment of this opportunity to grow spiritually with something that out of my control is out of my comfort zone. All right. So it's always about working with yourself, about using the situation outside to evolve, to grow, to become a greater person. As you do that, you're able to help other people. If you're busy, ang anxious and uptight about yourself, you can't help other people right? You're too lost within your own problems. I want you to be able to be powerful, strong, love, and bring that out to everybody, right? When you see somebody now and they're smiling and they're having fun with their child, that lifts you up. Not everybody's depressed, right? So I want you and everyone I'm talking to, to be that person, the one that brings light and love and joy in the midst of a, like we talk about Anne Frank. Remember that diary that Anne Frank wrote, right? It's like, wow, so many years later, in this terrible situation, we honor that. We literally, we, we get risen to this day that that girl was able to do that, don't we? Right? Be that. That's what I'm asking. This is your Anne Frank moment. And believe me, hers was much worse. Okay? But she still rose to it. Right? So I want that. That's the spiritual aspect of it, is you raise yourself up. Now, let's address what you asked. I have anxiety. What is anxiety? It is fears that you are creating within yourself. There's a difference between anxiety and I'm in trouble. There's a difference between being afraid of getting the virus and having the virus. Okay, when you have it, you have to deal with it. When you don't have it, you do your best not to get it. You, know, you wear your mask, you do your distancing, you don't go into big crowds. You, you be careful, right? But it should be fun. It's exciting when you're playing a sport you do your best. You don't get all anxious. What if, what if they get a touchdown? Oh my God, what am I going to do? No, you, you sit there and say, I'm going to play the game to the best of my ability. I'm going to enjoy doing it. I'm going to enjoy wearing the mask. I'm going to enjoy seeing that there are people out there who say it's wrong to wear a mask. Oh my God, what a world I live in. And every single thing that unfolds is an exciting experience of life. This is your life. You can't sit there and say, I want to put it on hold and wait till my life comes back. That, that's what creates the anxiety and the tension and all that kind of stuff. This is your life. You don't get to decide your life. You can do your best within the, you know, within the game, right? But there's other players and there's all kinds of other things. The question is, how are you doing with reality inside yourself? It's not against the law to be happy ever. You understand that? It's not against the law to be able to honor, respect, accept, embrace, but you still do your best. Once you get yourself inside to where you're not a problem, you didn't cause a problem inside yourself. I'm strong. I'm happy. I'm open. I'm embracing. I'm accepting. I feel love, right? I love what an amazing thing is happening. Now go out and help. Now go out and try to make it the best that it can be. Go out and raise other people. Go out and wear your mask. Go out and do your things. Okay, but at that point, you're bringing the joy that you found inside to the whole situation. And that's the highest thing you can do. The joy inside has nothing to do with the outside. Christ said, the man is not loved by bread alone, but by every word that leaveth the mouth of the Father. What does that mean? Well, the bread doesn't taste good right now. <laughs> the bread from the outside is rather stale. And it's got mold on it. Okay, but inside, the shakti, the flow of spirit that flows inside of you, it's not touched by that until you say it is, until you decide, no, this is wrong to stay open during these times. What good does it do to close? How did that help anybody? It didn't help you. It didn't help your family. It didn't help anybody. All right. So that's the spiritual position of this thing. Is it, it's called transcending the personal self. You rise above the part of you that wants to go and wallow and get down into the drama. It's like we have problems inside ourselves. We always have problems inside ourselves. We're human. 
right? When things like this happen, they give us an excuse for our problems. That's what happens to a lot of people. They sit there and say, now it really is bad. I knew it would get this way. You follow me? And it just becomes a channel to give me the right to wallow in the lower part of my being. Spirituality never does that. It doesn't deny the lower part of your being. You've got some issues. We got psychological issues in there, right? It's kind of hard not to, isn't it? Right? With all the things we go through in our lives and all that stuff. But you can rise above that. The consciousness, the witness, we get into the teachings now, is you're in there and you notice the anxiety. What do you do about that? Well, you don't deny it. You don't suppress it. You don't make believe it's not there. That's not what it means to rise above it. You honor, just like you honor and respect what's happening outside, you honor and respect what's happening inside. Oh, there's anxiety. So not abnormal during times like this that the human would feel anxiety. Am I okay with that? I'm not the anxiety. I'm noticing the anxiety. It's witness consciousness. Or it's the clarity of consciousness. That consciousness who's noticing the anxiety is not anxious. It's not anxious. Like what you're watching on TV doesn't make it you. You're the one who's watching the TV. Can you get to the point where you're willing to relax, notice the anxiety, and realize, I don't want to go there. It can be there, but I don't want to go there, all right? And you're going to find out that there's a deeper part of your being that is filled with joy, filled with love, filled with power, filled with light all the time until you decide to not hang out with that part of your being. So the spiritual answer is always the same. Sorry, all right? It's open and sound monotonous, right? return to the seat of self, honor and respect what's going on outside, honor and respect what's going on inside, which is what's left over of your problems, of your issues, of your psyche, of your ego, right? And, and relax and use, see, to me, it's not enough that you can handle the situation. Someday it's going to be over, okay? Everything passes, all right? Did you use it to go to God? That's spiritual. Did you literally use this situation to let go of a part of your being that's always been in there but you never had to deal with, but you were afraid to deal with it. Now you're being forced to deal with it. Good. Good. What an there's, opportunity. So there's a really important choice here. And, and I guess I'm, I'm wondering, and, and, you're, and you're, you're touching on it, where the location of that choice is, the choice to embrace experience, to embrace this outer reality that's occurring and the challenges that we face with it. Um, or to, or to wallow, to, to, to end up caught in, in the struggle against the experience and trying to avoid having the experience. Where, where is the seat, the location of that choice of going in, in one direction or the other? It, in, that's a deep question, a very deep question. The seat is the consciousness itself, is the awareness. If you feel depression, how, I, you know, I'm not a psychologist and they would never let me be. They'd throw me out, <laughs> okay? Because if someone came into my office and sat down and said, I feel depressed, you know what I would say? How do you know? What? How do you know? What do you mean? I feel depressed. How do you know you feel depressed? They'll get very mad at me and eventually they'll yell at me and I'll love it. And they'll say, because I'm in here, you idiot. And I see it. Who is that that sees it? That's the seat. All right. If you notice anxiety, if you notice fear, if you notice insecurity, right? Obviously, you notice it or you wouldn't be telling me about it. Who notices this? Because the one who's noticing anxiety is not anxious. The one who's noticing depression is not depressed. It's like I turn on a, a TV show that's got horror on it. I didn't become horror. And I turn on one that's, that's got darkness and depression. I'm not depressed. I'm watching something that is. That is your witness, that is the self, that is your Atman, that is your soul, call it whatever you want, right? It's, it's not a religious belief, you're in there. Now the question is, what are you doing in there? Normally, we have not worked with ourselves enough to where we are able to do anything in there. We get distracted by the most powerful force inside of ourselves, which is gonna be depression or you know, jealousy or fear or anxiety, right? They're powerful, they, it's like noise, they distract us. Then we lose our seat of self. And our whole being gets drawn into that like we get lost in a TV show or a movie, right? You have to work with yourself. And it doesn't, it'd be good if you worked with yourself before this because it's, it's hard, all right? But it's a perfect time, if you haven't, to realize, look at the price you're paying. This example I say, if you drop a hammer on your toe, right? The last place you want to put your consciousness is on your toe. 
you got fingers, you got all kinds of things that don't hurt. Why are you putting your consciousness down there? I mean, take care of it by all means, but why would you want to put all of your consciousness under the part that hurts the most? That's what you're doing psychologically. You're putting all of your awareness on the depression, on the anxiety, and so on. So now we can at some point talk about, well, how do you do that? How do you learn not to do that, right? First of all, is only great beings, enlightened masters able to do that? Or is everybody able to do that? Everybody is able to do that. Everybody. If you're a human being, you're evolved enough to where your consciousness is capable of centering within itself and knowing itself as self. You are capable of it, all right? Just like you're capable of playing a sport, a little bit at least, capable of playing a piano, a little bit doesn't mean you're a master, right? But at least to some degree, you have the right to free yourself. And there's a process that you learn, and this is a perfect time to do it. It's not a bad time to do it, it's a perfect time to do it. Michael, you, um, you've written and, and you, you just actually mentioned it a little moment ago that um, most of life will unfold uh, in accordance with forces outside of our control. And now more than ever, I, I, I truth, truthfully see the, 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 how, how accurate that statement is. And as we read the news, we do feel powerless and out of control. Uh, people want their old lives back but again, feel powerless to make it happen. And I'm wondering how can your statement become a comfort as opposed to a bitter truth at this moment? No, that's a beautiful question because it should be a comfort. How, how much fun have you had so far trying to control everything? <laughs> Forget this, trying to control everything, everything in your family, everything in your relationships, everything in your finance, everything in your business, everything in what everybody thinks of you. How much fun you having? You hear me? It ain't that much fun, is it? Okay, so this is just something that's called a wake, a slap in the face. It's a wake up call. But that slap's a nice slap. That's like, hey, wake up, wake up, you know? So you start, and I, I teach this all the time this question of do you have control? All right, it's been here for 13.8 billion years. How long have you been here? Don't answer. Okay, but I know it's much less, <laughs> right? 13.8 billion years. No human beings were here. It made itself. Whether you think science did it or God did it, it's the same. It doesn't matter. You didn't do it. You had nothing to do with it, right? All the quantum field made the quarks and leptons and bosons, and they all came together by the forces of science, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's this whole world, and you dropped down here a few years ago. It's been going on everywhere. You follow me? How can you think you're in control? That's the funniest thing I ever heard of. You're not, a, you're, I don't know what, the fraction is so small of what you're in control of, it's ridiculous. Even if you want to figure it out that you're not in control of what's in front of you, right? It has history. You didn't make it. Somebody walks into your field of view. What was their history? Where did they come from? What were their parents like? I always say to somebody, if your great, great, great grandmother didn't meet your great, great, great grandfather, you're not here. Okay? How much control do you have over anything? And then that's just the moment you're in. How many moments are there that you're not in that are going on on this planet or in the universe? How much control you have? There's where you wake up and realize that's a joke that we sit there and say, I want my life back. It's, first of all, it's not your life. You didn't, you have, well, how much is it? 20 trillion cells within your body are working together, communicating to each other. You don't even know who they are. You never say thank you. You're in your whole life, they're doing these things. Give me a break. If you dare to think about it, you realize you just should be saying thank you to everything, right? To your existence, to everything. And you're not in control, and this is a wake-up call. So this question of you get your life back, right? It's this tiny little piece of laser beam in time. It's nothing. Soon you will not be here. You will have dropped down to a planet for a few years. You will have left. What did you do while you're here? That's the question. And if you tell me what I did was struggle and suffer and be depressed, I don't think you did real well. Do you understand that? And it has nothing to do with what's going on outside, including the pandemic. That's just another event that is out of your control, right? The weather is out of your control. If all of a sudden your spouse, you know, some latent genes spoop up and they get sick or they go crazy, right? It's, you got to deal with it. <laughs> Wake up. You can't sit around and say, I want my life back. I want my life back, all right? Nothing goes backwards. You just keep moving forward, honoring, respecting, working to do your best, 
It's so beautiful if, if you embrace it. Otherwise, you're stuck. Does that make so sense key, to you? It makes sense. And the key is letting go of this expectation that we can control the outside world, the outside events. What we can control is our response. That's right. The, cho the internal <laughs> and spiritual choices we make in response to what happens outside. That's right. Outside. That's, right. That's exactly right. I, to me, it's not even enough to say, right, that we have to let go of our expectation of what's going to happen. Or what should happen, right? Ultimately, and you know it because you're deep, you have to let go of yourself. Christ said you have to die to be reborn. That's what that means. You want to talk deep, right? You're not just letting go that I'm in here and I have a me that has concepts and views and hopes and dreams and values. And that's why, well, that's not who you are, right? That's a thing you built, a psyche. That's something, a self-concept that you built within your mind, isn't it? You're a psychologist, right? You built that within your mind. You who's in there noticing is who you are, so you have to be willing to literally let go of this false image of yourself so that you're perfectly comfortable if you were, C if you were CEO of a company and now the company went out of business, right? By all means, do the best you can that it doesn't, right? But if that's who you are, enjoy your new position. Enjoy what you're doing. Don't sit there and say, no, I can't be happy unless I'm back to what I thought I was because that's not who you were anyways, right? You were the self the consciousness looking at a self-concept that said, I'm a CEO, right? So that I, spiritually, that, you know, I'm crazy. I want to go the whole way. Spiritually, it's not even enough to say, I accept that things aren't the way I want. Well, that's good. That's a very good step, right? I want you to realize who wanted it, who, who made this decision in here and how did it decide that? Because it's obviously out of harmony with reality because it's not matching. I think I'll let go of that. Whoa. I'd like to look at another issue and something that I'm seeing more and more now as, as the crisis continues to roll along and, and people get exhausted and um, unsure about, you know, where things are going, the total unpredictability that we face. Uh, people are struggling with, with anger uh, and divisiveness. Sen the sense that something is terribly wrong, perhaps the authorities aren't handling it right. Yep. Uh, and I'm wondering is, if there is a spiritual response that could help with this anger. Is there a spiritual opportunity here? There, there is, absolutely. It's the same thing that I, I said. Is, what is anger? Let's talk spiritually. You have, and you know it, you have inside of you energy. Shakti, spirit, chi, call it whatever you want. All right? There's energy in there. When it's flowing nicely, you call it joy. You call it love. You call it inspiration, right? When it's not, you say, I'm depressed. Those are energy states, high and low energy, all right? So basically, if you block your energy, if you're blocking your energy, then you're not going to feel, you're not going to feel that openness. Anger is that this very same energy, the same energy you feel as love, the same energy you feel as a spiritual uplifting of God, if that energy is blocked, it needs to find a way out. So it can't go up horizontally. It's always trying to go up. It can't go up horizontally. So, it, uh, excuse me, vertically, right? So it tries to, so it goes out horizontally, all right? And that's what anger is. It is that very anger, the beautiful energy of love, of God, of spiritual. When it can't move, it becomes, it's like a short circuit on a wire. The wire is beautiful. It's bringing energy, but you block it. Ooh, that, you don't want to be around that thing, do you? All right? That's what anger is. It's that very same energy shooting out because it has to express itself. So if you're feeling anger, don't, it's, you don't focus on the anger. People, that's what people say, how, how do I deal, there's like a short circuit, how do I deal with the smoke and the fire? No, no, deal with the wire. <laughs> deal with the cause, what is blocking the wire? Then you don't have to worry about the smoke and the fire. That's a problem people do. It goes out and there's all this anger and then it goes towards somebody and they worry about, oh, how do I work with the fact that I feel anger toward this person? No, no, come all the way back. Well, how do I deal with the fact that I feel anger? No, 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 come all the way back. What is the blockage that is keeping this energy from flowing properly so that it has to shoot out like that? That's where you work, that's the core. Buddhists say work at the root, that's the root. So if somebody's feeling anger during these times, it's because of all the things we've been talking about, because they, they want their life back. They feel frustrated. They don't feel any control. They don't like what other people are doing. In other words, they're in there holding on to their psyche and that psyche is not getting what it wants right now. 
You understand that? It does what we call close. It, you know, it closes down. Nothing's working the way I want. If nothing's working the way I want, I, I'm not, I, don't, I don't want to have to deal with it. I'm going to close down. And when you close down, the energy needs to go somewheres. And very often it comes out as anger. It builds up enough and comes out as anger. So you have to be willing to, everything we've been talking about is the answer. You have to be willing to sit there and say, I'm not going to fight this. I'll do my best, but I'm not going to fight it inside. Inside, I honor and respect that a big change is taking place and I'm able to handle this and I'm going to stay open. That's the key. I'm going to stay open. That's all. If I feel scared, I'm going to release, relax. You know what I teach? Relax and release. You feel something start to build, relax and release. No, yes. What good does anger do? Nothing. It wastes all the good energy that you could use to feel joy, to help other people and so on. So it's always the same thing. Are you willing to work on yourself or do you think there needs to be an answer outside that keeps you from being angry? In a sense, if, it gets, if, it, if you feel anger and then it gets fixed up, you know, something happens and you feel better, right? You wasted the experience because you never worked with yourself. You waited for the it's conditional, it's conditional well-being. You waited for the outside to straighten up what's wrong inside of you. It'll never stay that way. You know that. Something else will happen. So there's a tremendous opportunity. I, I know I don't like to talk as people don't want to hear it. It's a tremendous opportunity for spiritual growth because it is out of your control and you have this opportunity to say, fine, I'm going to grow from this. I'm going to use it to go to God. At times you, you've referred to this blocked energy as sanskara, as, as something that um, sort of a, a node of energy that, that, that doesn't, as you said, it doesn't move. It, 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 uh, and the sense I have as you're talking that, that this blockage literally comes from the unwillingness to feel the pain and to, uh, trying, to, trying, to, trying to push it away or get rid of it. I, I don't want to feel that pain, whether it's the anger or the depression, or it's, uh, it's the sadness, the fear, whatever it is. I don't want to feel that and I'm going to push it away. And in the act of pushing it away, I block the energy and now I'm stuck with the pain. I'm stuck with that painful emotion because I didn't want to experience it. I wouldn't allow it. Is that a fair way of describing what you're teaching us? I, I, that's, that's perfect. That's exactly right. All right. Is, and it's not, it shouldn't be thought of as the events that are happening now. You know, psychology, you know that, right? There are things throughout your life that happened childhood, this, that, et cetera, et cetera, that you didn't want to feel the pain. You didn't want, I can't handle this. I don't want to feel this, all right? So the event happens outside, your parents get divorced, you know, something happens, a child, you know, something happens. So basically that takes place, it comes in, and you don't want to feel it. I don't, you know, Freudian. <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want to experience this, all right? And so you use your will, you have will inside to push it away. Okay, whether you think of it as suppression or repression, or it's not that different, right? It says from Scarx, a, a Sanskrit term from thousands of years before Freud, all right? But basically, you push it away, and what happens is the energy of the event, every event has energy. It comes from outside, inside, and then passes through. But you didn't let it pass through. You resisted it, so it froze inside of you. It's like you, you made an ice cube out of it, so it stayed there. So what happens now is that other things try to come in, and they hit that. And they bring that up. So now it's compounded, all right? So like probably right now, if you had stayed clean and perfect throughout your life, you would have no trouble handling this. But the fact that your father lost his job and then the family fell apart or this happened or that happened, you've got all this stuff in here, right? That's packed with power. And so when an event happens that reminds you of it, that touches it, you get all this magnification of emotion and problems and issues and whoa, so yes, yes, the scars are the essence of the problem. And that's why I'm saying you use this, it's going to hit your scars. It's going to hit your relationship stuff. It's going to hit the children's stuff. It's going to hit the finance stuff. It's going to hit, you don't believe that, you know, they're dealing with it properly. Just everything, right? Fine. It's an opportunity to let that go. Again, it doesn't mean you don't deal with it, but you don't deal with it out of the reaction of your scars. Do you understand that? You deal with it out of the clarity of your being. Like, what can I do to help here? 
not, I can't handle this, this is ridiculous, <laughs> right? It's not out of anger, it's not out of anything like that. So you use it as an opportunity to let go of the past some scars, and for God's sake, please don't take on new ones. Like someday, hopefully, and not hopefully, someday this will be over, everything passes, all right? I don't want you left with some giant, some scar that every time somebody sneezes, you freak out or you keep wearing your mask for the rest of your life because who knows? It could be asymptomatic everywhere. You follow me? I don't want it screwing you up. I want it to make you greater because you went through something well. That's what you did. You handled it well. That answer you? Thank you, Michael. Like we touched on stress a little bit, but um, I... I see an enormous amount of stress, uh, and I think a lot of it driven by unpredictability. Um, and so many of my clients, so many people I know, uh, are stressed further by how they're responding to the crisis. And I think this is something you're really getting at. Um, it's it's they're stressed by how they think and how they try to cope. Uh, and it, and it, it's like the two arrows of Buddhism. The first, of course, is the actual wound, and the second arrow is the things we do to cope and push away the pain that end up making it worse. And I, I'm wondering how people can respond to this difficult time without taking that second arrow. Right, so now we're getting to technique, right? which is very good. It's, to me, you know, Freud said, well, they say 50, 50, recognition of the problem is 50%, right? In, in spirituality, it's way more. Your willingness to recognize what's going on and say not, not on my watch. I'm going to do better than this. That's like 90%. Buddhists call that intent. You follow me? If you don't have the, the intent, it ain't going to happen. I don't care. You meditate all you want. Go do whatever you want. You follow me? If your intent is not to straighten up in here and let go of these samskaras and so on. So where I have gotten, and is what I teach, you know that, is it's very simple. Something happens, even a thought, right? Something happens, you start to feel tension. Relax. And what people say to me, I can't relax. No, what you mean is it won't relax. The thing that's getting up tight, it won't relax. I didn't say for it to relax. I said for you to relax. You who noticed that it's starting to get tight in your belly, that anger is starting to build up, you, the self, the consciousness, relax. How can I relax? Because it's not you. You're separate from it, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn on a TV show, Stephen King, Horror. All right, relax. I can't. Yes, you can. It's just a TV show. What do you mean you can't relax? I want you to relax. Relax. Practice. Close your eyes when it's on. Okay, I'm okay now. Open them very slowly. Can you relax each step? Of the, just find the reality that if you want to, you're the boss in there. Do you understand that? You, that's your house. There's nobody else in there, right? Is there? Your kids aren't in there. Parents aren't in there. Nothing. You are in there. Relax, relax, relax. I give the example, it's very deep, that let's say you're in a tug of war. I always say with, with the whole University of Florida Gator football teams on the other end, and you're trying to go home to eat lunch, right? And you're learning all these techniques of digging your heels in, of pulling, of maximizing your weight. You got judo teacher, you got everything, right? And Yoda shows up and Yoda says, relax. You say, if I relax, they're gonna pull me through the mud. I'll never go. He says, relax, no. Relax your hands. What do you mean? You're not even noticing your hands. You've got feet and body and weight. Do you follow me? Relax your hands. What happens if you relax your hands? The rope, drop, no connection. That's how you relax. Don't make the thing relax. You're connecting yourself to the thing. You're paying attention to it too much, right? Just realize I'm in here holding onto the rope that's tied to tension. What if I let go? That's it. That's it. That's how you do it. Insights like that right away. And then fall back. Just relax. Like you're water skiing, right? And you don't want to do it anymore. Let go. No, they can't hear me. Stop. No, they don't have to stop. Just let go. <laughs> That's what letting go is, all right? That's how you deal with this. And if you will do that to start with, every time something hits your stuff, every time you have the thought about what if, what if thing, oh my God, what am I going to do? Oh, he's not wearing a mask, but, right? Just first relax. That's all a spiritual person. That's the first thing they always do is relax. Now that you're not being reactive and getting all involved in your stuff, open your eyes and see if you can help. See if there's something constructive, not reactive and not expressing your garbage, right? 
but something constructive that you can do for the situation. But relax first. So we achieve relaxation by moving our attention away from the problem or the samskara back to the seat of awareness, back to that observer self. Is, is that the process by which we, we begin to it is, that relaxation? It is correct to say that that is the result of what happens. I wouldn't say that that's how you do it because there's too much doership there. That's sort of saying I'm attached to this outcome, but I don't want to be. So I'll, I'll be attached, but not act like I'm attached. Like it's sort of like it's too late. Okay. So it's not that you're involved in it, but then you let it go. It's you sit back and realize, I see that. That's all. I see that. You don't go back to the self. You're already in the self. It's like saying, I'm watching TV. How do I get back to the couch? How do I get back to the couch? Right? Oh, I stop watching the TV. Then I come back to the couch. You never left the stupid couch. You're sitting on the couch watching TV. <laughs> do you follow me? That's where I want you to see that difference. All right? Is you're, you are sitting on the couch of self. You've never left ever, ever. But you are projecting your consciousness onto the object of consciousness right? Just let go. Cease to project, right? But you don't, it's not like an act of will that you're not projecting. You're just relaxing. That's why relaxing, if you relax enough sitting on the couch, right, you won't be watching the TV. You'll be feeling the couch on your butt and around you. That's how it's, that's what it feels like to sit back in the seat of self. It's not an effort. It's not something you're doing. It's something you're not doing. Do you follow me? You, you don't go back to the seat of self. You cease to leave. Can you see the difference? Absolutely. But, oh, thank you, Michael. I, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about trauma. And, um, you know, I have this PTSD clinic in the Bay Area and serves people with very few resources. But many have had trauma earlier in life and are appearing to get re-traumatized uh, by the uncertainty, the unpredictability, yep. the loss of control that is associated with this period of crisis. And um, is there wisdom you can offer them? Yeah, well, it, it's sad to have, I, I almost get sad because I have such compassion of what people have had to go through, okay? And, and what could traumatize one person doesn't, tra doesn't traumatize another. It doesn't matter. The point is, it's hard to not resist things that are uncomfortable. We, know, we do it with tiny little things. It's raining, I wanted to go skiing. <laughs> it's like, give me a break, right? Yeah, why did it have to rain on the weekend? Why did it have to rain on my birthday? I'm having trouble, are you? <laughs> right? And then people have real problems. So it's, it's important to have compassion and understand how difficult it is to do these things we're talking about. But it doesn't matter. You, start, you still have to do them. Otherwise, you're left a mess. Do you understand that? It's not like I'm going to feel, because I've worked, not a lot, but I've had some people come out with PTSD to the temple, and they've done very well. And they've told me how they got over this stuff, right? You, you can, all right? What is, what is trauma? It's a really big samskara. That's why it's different, <laughs> okay? It's like that thing was really hard to deal with. I suppressed the hell out of it. I don't even want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. It didn't even happen. I don't know what's going on with me. I just can't sleep, all right? And you just push it away and all that energy of how difficult the situation is, you now stored in that samskara, okay? Now, to deal with it, you rationalize. You, people do, you know this. They do all, people do all kinds of things just to be able to tolerate and deal with it. Now what happens is all the things that they did are falling apart right? They were able to build something on top of it, and now it doesn't work anymore. And so not only do I have the problem with what's happening now, but this whole trauma comes back up. So it's totally understandable, correct? It, it, it's yoga. I mean, that's yoga, right? That's some scars down there. It's going to get hit, and it's going to come back up. So the question is the same thing. It's really the same thing we've been talking about. First, do you want to get over this? Not do you want to fix the, the pandemic so you can get back to hiding your stuff, right? Do you want to use this to say, hey, I'm going to let this thing go once and for all. It's good that something has happened and my hiding mechanism is not working. That's strong, right? But you know it's true, right? And I want, 
I don't want you to fix what I'm feeling now. I want to use this as an opportunity to finally bring this thing up and let it go. That's first and foremost. And I know you work with your people that way, all right? It doesn't do a whole lot of good, right? But Christ said, don't build your house on sand, right? Well, if you didn't, it starts to fall down. I, I don't want to bring in someone that kind of hardens the sand a little bit, right? You got to do something greater than that. So how do you do that? You start with the intent. You start with saying, yes, this is a terrible situation. And so was my past situation. You follow me? It was a terrible situation. I don't want to carry this around. I don't want to ruin my life. I don't want to ruin my life. It's just as simple. Is it easy to go off drugs? No, you have to go through withdrawal. Is it easy to let this stuff go? No, it's just like withdrawal. You have to be willing to go through it, all right? And this can help you. It can help you because you can sit there and say, all right, I'm going to handle this. That will help me see that I can handle that when it comes up. There's just so many positive things that a bad, a terrible situation can be used for to make you a greater being. So that, that, and so how do you do that? The only thing, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a therapist, I don't work with people one on one, all right? But the only thing I have found that has worked with me, and then you see all these people doing so well with the books and so on, is the moment something happens, I don't care what level it is. If you're feeling insecure because of the virus, and then you say hello to a friend and they don't say hello back, or, or because their mask was on, you thought there was somebody that they weren't and you embarrassed yourself, good, let go. Whatever level you can start with, practice relaxing. Fine, I, I embarrassed myself. Fine, I see that, right? Relax. Because if you, can, if you can't handle the embarrassment, how the hell are you going to handle the trauma that you stored down there, right? It's just it's like practicing the piano, right? You start with the scales. If people would just realize that. You build your ability to handle things. Wow, by handling them. <laughs> it's just like working out with weights. It doesn't have to be a big thing, right? If you, if you can lift 100 pounds, you, you want to do, do 200 or 150, start with 100.001. I guarantee you can do it, right? And you just start handling and realizing, hey, I can do this. And eventually you will get to the point that that which used to bother you, you don't even notice it anymore. It doesn't even hit anything. Right now, you're getting some that's spiritual growth, real spiritual growth, not how many hours you can meditate or how many gurus you met. Right? It's about can you see now? And it's also psychological growth. Right? Can you see now that that which used to freak you out, you don't even you, you walk away? Somebody says it to me, says, I didn't realize it until I was driving home. What happened at the office would have bothered the hell out of me a year ago. I didn't even notice it. I had to think back and say, Wow, isn't that funny? That's great. And then if you can do that one, you can do another one and another one. And you climb your stairway to heaven, not a jump, <laughs> okay? And, you, and, and so that's how you deal with it. So trauma, as terrible as trauma is, or even scared of the word, it's not different. It's just a really big scar. You follow me? The piano piece is really hard to play, right? But you can do it. You can work with it, practice little by little. And so it's almost like you don't work direct with the trauma. You work with the ability to handle problems. And if you can handle any other problems, next thing you know, this thing starts to come up. Ah, I can do that. I handled the divorce. I handled this. I handled that. Right? Okay, fine. I had a tough time at the war. And next thing you know, it passes through. I'd like to thank you so much. I'd, I'd like to look at a more specific example regarding trauma. One of the things that we see a lot at the clinic is, you know, people struggle with early trauma or, in, the, in their family of origin. Uh, and as a result of the trauma, they develop beliefs about themselves, schemas. Uh, and one of the most uh, frequently held beliefs that grow out of trauma is the belief in one's own defectiveness and that there's something wrong with me. And along with that belief, when it gets activated again, each time it gets activated throughout one's life, is this enormous welling of shame. And so we see that. And, and so new events come along, new challenges come along that activate that I'm, I'm not okay, there's something wrong with me belief and, and the accompanying shame. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, you know, and apply what you were just saying to, to this kind of specific situation that shows up an awful lot. How, how, how can they respond to that? Well, the beauty of the deep spiritual teachings is everything is the same. They're just different flavors. Like, like I, different flavors of ice cream, <laughs> different colors on the scale, right? If you are willing to and realize, how do you know you feel shame? I feel it. It comes up. 
who feels it? You're describing to me what it feels like. That's why you all use those therapies, all right? <laughs> Write about your stuff as well, right? Who is noticing that there's shame? Because that step that says there is shame, but I'm not it. I'm noticing shame. I'm noticing defectiveness. I'm noticing I have this story, right? Whatever you call it, different stories, right? I have a story inside my head that gets triggered, and then I'm thinking this about myself. How do you know? If you tell me your story, I don't know your story. How do you know that's going on in there? What, are you a psychologist? How dare you know what's going on inside of the mind? Because I'm in here. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to one who's in there. I want to know what it's like to notice shame, what it's like to notice insecurity and a sense of defectiveness, all right? Because that one who's noticing is not defective. In fact, it's God, right? The kingdom is within you. My father and I are one. You have no idea how great, even in a person with all those problems, the self is as pure. It's perfect. It's beyond comprehension. It is Christ. It is beyond Christ. It is Buddha. It is beyond Buddha. That's who's back there noticing this BS, all right? It's so much faster to let it go by being who you are than to say, I have to undo all this stuff, all my karma, all my past impressions, all my samskaras. Do you understand that? Oh my God, that's going to take a long time. And I'm not even talking about past lives. Shh. <laughs> you get a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> so basically, it's always the same answer. I don't have any answers that if I'm in here and I'm feeling shame and I'm totally lost in it, what do I do? I'm going to give you the same answer. Notice that you're noticing and try to be comfortable noticing. That's the best advice I have. At first, it's hard because you get pulled into it, but it's just like a drug. It's an addiction. You follow me? You're addicted to that feeling. That's what you told me. They're addicted to that pattern. Break the addiction. How? By relaxing through it. I can handle this. That's your mantra. I can, ha I can handle this. Yes, I feel shame. I see shame. It's hard. I feel shame, all right? But it's not me. I'm the one who experiences it. Just relax, relax, relax. You won't be perfect at it, but you can learn. And what a great thing to learn. And then if you learn it about that shame, next thing you know, you learned it about all kinds of things. Because it's it really the feeling that you can't handle. The experience is what you can't handle, not the shame. You follow me? Something else would feel just as bad. And all of a sudden, it's like you've learned a tolerance, or not even tolerance, an acceptance of that level of discomfort. You change your whole life. Hear me? Now all of a sudden the boss says, come on in, I want to talk to you today. And it's, you're okay, you'll talk to him. You're not freaking out, right? Because you handled the shame. <laughs> so there's a willingness, a willingness to, to allow that experience uh, and, and at the same time move forward with making the best kind of response we can with the circumstance that's shown up. That's the key. It's not, you, the word is you're in the world but not of it. You follow me? So you're not like denouncing the world. You're not denying your responsibilities or, or anything like that. What you're realizing is if I have shame and insecurity, they don't make good decisions. I'll ask you, you're a psychologist. How often do shame and insecurity make good decisions? Very rarely. Oh, how about never? <laughs> you're being nice. <laughs> you must have some of those. They're friends, right? So the answer is never. How can shame and insecurity make a good? I mean, I, I guess they say a clock. A broken clock's always right, can be right twice a day, all right? So yeah, I'll give that to you, all right? But otherwise, they make terrible decisions. So the willingness to let them go and not let them be who you are, even a little bit, even if you just let go a little bit, you're better off. Do you follow me, all right? But if you can get clarity and realize, I don't want those making my decisions, so I'm going to breathe, I'm going to center, I'm going to look outside, and if they start coming up, I'm going to take a moment, it's not a one-time thing. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ride this horse, all right? Then make the best decision you can given the clarity you have at the time. It will be better than the decision you would have made because you know, guilt and insecurity and all those things make terrible decisions. And then over time, you're going to find out that it's almost as if you're being guided. It's almost, people say like, oh my God, God came in and he guided me. It's, it's not that you're being guided. It's that you stop screwing it up. Do you understand that? It's the universe made itself. It's a pretty amazing place, isn't it? Your body with trillions and trillions of cells and all the organs and everything, you didn't make that. You hear me? It's pretty perfect. It's immune system. All the things it has is amazing, isn't it? Okay? 
you're going to find out that if you stop screwing it, like if you go do drugs and smoke a lot, you can mess it up real good. If you get all involved with your shame and you're this and you're that and can't handle your past, you're going to mess life up. Where do you see what life looks like when you stop doing that? You've heard the word, the Tao, haven't you? That's what the life looks like. The balance, the natural unfolding of things, and there's a perfection to it, a tremendous perfection. Not perfection, get what you want. That's your stuff. But you start noticing, wow, it's doing better than I could ever do. Of course it is. It's connected to reality. How can it not do better than you? You're a mess. <laughs> you just, I was using the example of, I love when the lake is crystal clear and totally still but then a leaf drops in and it makes ripples. I don't like that, so I'll jump in and get the leaf out. No, I don't think so, all right? The best thing you can do is leave it alone. The nat natural way of things when you stop interfering is amazing. It's just all, anyone who's ever done it, read the 23rd Psalm, right? It's just like, wow, the unfolding of the perfection of the universe, not it's perfect for what you want. It's not about attracting to yourself what you want. It's about coming in harmony with that which created the stars and the moons and the galaxies and your body and trees and oh my god <laughs> all right so that's i wanted to ask you a little bit about the problem of desire because i think one of the things that happens during a crisis during a period of uncertainty of, of unpredictability is that people begin to fear that they're not going to get the things that they've wanted that, uh, or the, the things they wanted will be taken away, these opportunities, or, or a sense of the future that has things that they were hoping for and wanting somehow gets uh, more distant and, and less possible. And I'm wondering how we, you would apply these spiritual principles to, to that problem of desire and, and the sense that one will somehow be denied uh, what one has wanted. Very deep. I love talking to you, right? Because one, you're very deep, but also you're a psychologist, right? And psychology is dealing with the stuff you're asking me about. Spirituality is dealing with what's behind the stuff you're asking me about, okay? And therefore the answer is always that. So someone, all right, first of all, what is desire? I always, I love talking to people about it. What is desire, right? It is a lacking. I'm sorry. If, if you're fulfilled, you don't have desire, <laughs> okay? If you just ate, I don't, I don't want anything, all right? If you're, if you're the person you love and someone says, Where do you want to, what do you want to do? Who do you want to be with? Leave me alone, right? If you feel fulfilled inside, you don't have desire. It is because of a lacking inside, and then you've made up what you think, if it happens outside, will make me feel wholer inside. If I have the boat, and people are attracted to me, and I got the Ferrari, and everybody's jealous, and, right? These things will take care of the fact that I don't feel okay inside. So a desire is not some positive thing. It's a sickness. Do you understand that? You're taking medication because you're not okay. If you were okay, you wouldn't be taking medication. You have desires because your inside is not fulfilled. You don't feel whole. You don't feel content. You don't feel what you want to feel, okay? So you mind thinks, of mind, mind's your friend. Mind says, okay, well, if you get this, you'll be better. You get a girlfriend. You get this. You change your relationship. You get a door. Blah, 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 blah. Lose 10 pounds, right? Whatever it is, these things will make you better inside. Everybody understands that, but they don't understand it means something's wrong inside. See, so a yogi understands it is not supposed to be broken inside. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be the most beautiful place in the universe is supposed to be inside of you. Not you need things to be a certain way outside to be okay inside. That's because you're blocked. That's because of these samskaras. That energy, when it flows, is what you mean by love, what you mean by inspiration, what you mean by, whoa, you hear me? Rushes and high. What if that was going on all the time? What desires would you have? None, right? Like you just doesn't mean you don't interact with the world, but you do it out of love. You do it out of joy. You can't wait to go to work. You don't need it to be a certain way. You don't need the corner office. Who cares? I'm glad he got it, right? Because you feel whole and complete within yourself. So the yoga says not how do I, that's why it's not about laws of attraction or something. It's not how do I get what I want. It's why do I need it? What's wrong inside of me that I don't feel whole and complete? And that's what you work with. And what you're going to find out, and we've talked about it, it's these blockages. It's these samskaras that you built inside block your energy so it can't flow. All right. So if you work on getting rid of those, you're going to find instead of placating them, trying to compensate for them. Right. I feel lonely. I need somebody. No, no. You feel lonely because you're blocked. 
There's nothing wrong with having somebody. If you're filled with love, you get to share the love with somebody else. It's beautiful, but not, I don't have love. So I need to find somebody that will make me feel love. That's why relationships don't work. Okay. You have a blockage, work with it, let it go. You're going to feel love. You're going to feel inspiration. You're going to feel joy. The more, it's not all or nothing. The more you let go, the happier you are for no reason at all. It's just a natural state inside of you, the beauty of your own being, all right? That's how, you, that's how a yogi, a spiritual person, deals with desire. They don't suppress them. They don't hate them. They don't renounce. You follow me? Renunciation is ridiculous. It means I think this thing will make me happy, but I won't do it. Why? Because God doesn't want me to. I bet you don't like God too much, do you? <laughs> it's like, what kind of thing is that to do? That's ridiculous. You own it yourself. I, I don't feel whole because I'm blocked. I don't like my job because I think another one will make me happier because this doesn't fulfill my ego needs or this or that or the other thing, right? And so you start letting go of yourself and you're going to find out that you feel whole, that you feel complete. And desire just, it falls away, like sheds, like a skin off a snake. You don't, you don't fight with it, you don't do anything. But if you devote your life to getting your drug, you'll never get off the drug. Well, that's what desire is. It's a compensating thing that your mind decided this will make me feel well instead of why don't I feel well? You hear me? Okay, so that I can let go. And that's your, it's always your inner work. So desire is easy. It's easy. And, and then the thought that I could lose something, that means you're using it as a crutch. I mean, it's hard to talk to today because we're humans, all right? But still, let's talk the truth. You're, you've, you're using it as a crutch. You've got this big, beautiful house right? Which you couldn't afford, but because your job, you, know, you look barred enough, <laughs> your job was there. Now the neighbors are jealous and everyone likes to come over. You like to do all your stuff and it feeds your ego. It feeds something that makes you feel good. You follow me? Now, all of a sudden, you lost your job. This happened, that happened. You can't afford the mortgage anymore. You got to downsize, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. Enjoy it. Enjoy the house. Enjoy the downsize. But I can't. Why? Because I was using the house to compensate for what's wrong inside of me. And really, that's what it's about. It's not about the house. I don't want to cover the house. There's 50 rooms I don't even use. All right? It's about the ego. It's about the self-concept. I was using it to build what was wrong inside of me. Well, I don't think you want to do that. So use this as an opportunity to say, I want to let go of my blockages so I don't have to be dependent upon things outside. I can enjoy them. There's nothing wrong with that. But I have a dependency that, that I'm not whole unless I have a house, <laughs> unless I have a certain car. That's ridiculous. You follow me? So that's what happens when you work on yourself. Eventually, well, I mean, we haven't talked about that. You get to a certain point. There's a tipping point where you, you were, had troubles, you had moods, you had different things. They're all going to go away. Moods are not normal. Troubles are not normal. None of that stuff's normal. It's all due to the blockages. All these emotions are due to the blockages coming out in different ways, all right? As you let go of your blockages, you let go of your past stuff that you stored in there, right? There's more energy. It can flow, and it starts to rise up your, your system. And eventually, you feel this upward rush of energy all the time, day and night, you wake up in the morning, it's going on. You go through the day, problems outside. It doesn't matter. It's just flowing up all the time, feeding you from the inside. That's what Christ meant. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that leaves in the mouth of the Father. All right? You feel this energy flowing up inside. At that point, you're whole. You're complete. You don't have problems with desire. You don't have problems with loss. You don't have problems with any of that stuff. You know, the Buddhist teaching teach that gain and loss are the same thing. Tell a normal human being that gain and failure and success are the same thing. They don't even understand what you're talking about, right? Because success means I got what I wanted. Failure means I didn't. If you're whole within yourself, it's just a dance. You know, you do your best, you win the game, you lose the game. You still do your best. It's fun, right? But you weren't living off of that. That's where we need to get people, all right? That's the ultimate transpersonal psychology. That's the ultimate of what a psychologist can do for somebody, is bring them to a state where they're whole and complete within themselves so that they can handle everything that happens and there's no more issues. That state exists. So desire is, is one form of coping with these blockages that doesn't really work very well. It, it makes us vulnerable because if we don't get what we desire, uh, this drug we've been taking is, uh, is not available and, and we're thrown back into the pain in some way. And it makes me think a little bit about coping because uh, 
it seems like there are um, pretty unhealthy ways that people are are coping uh, during this uncertainty. And I'm and I'm wondering uh, if there are wiser ways to handle this pain. I told you, all right. I, I, I just I told you. Well, you keep going back to the same thing. It's like if you understand that you are the most beautiful thing that ever walked the face of the earth, but you are looking at something that isn't. You've built this system, this psyche inside yourself, a self-concept that's built on top of your blockages, all right? You built your house on sand. I always say, Christ said, don't build on sand. You built it on poop, all right? You went further, right? You just built it on top of a mess, didn't you, right? All these things you stored inside from your past experience that you didn't like, you built your house on top of that. So you have to be willing to say, I don't want to do that for the rest of my life. That's why people have midlife crises, correct? They realize it didn't work. I got everything I needed. I don't feel any different than I did before, right? I don't want you to have to live that way. I want you to feel joy and love and completeness within your own being. So to do that, you have to look at this and say, it's not about coping. It's about using this to let go of the blockages. And so you, you make it fun. You make it a sport. It's a game. How well can I do every single day to let go of the things that are keeping me down? So that's how you grow. That's how you cope. You, know, right? you cope by letting go. Thank you, Michael. Uh, one last question, if I can. Um, and I, I'd like to return to where we began. Um, uh, gr grief for the impermanence of things, uh, for the enormous losses that we sometimes face in life and and losses that often get amplified during a time of crisis and we respond to these losses with with shock and disbelief and, and denial and sadness and anger a lot of the things that we've been talking about today and sometimes over over time some of us do find a way to acceptance and i i just like to leave with this question about you know what spiritual paths or practices can help move us from these earlier stages of grief into acceptance again it's the same thing the human being the human psyche which you're a professional i'm not but the human psyche has its nature right it is made out of these building blocks that we stored inside freud said so and he's, he's right this is so beautiful how True traditional psychology is exactly the same thing that yoga the yogis found out sitting in the caves thousands and thousands of years ago, which is we've stored this stuff inside and we made a whole mindset out of these concepts and views and opinions and likes and dislikes and preferences. All right. So now it's difficult to live with because the world doesn't doesn't match. All right. So you start by saying, I am from this moment forward in my life going to make the meaning of my life, not like a you know, weekend the meaning of my life to clean up in here. That's not just make it good enough so I can cope. I'm gonna clean up in here. That's what I'm gonna do every single day, every single minute, whatever's happening, I'm gonna use it to let go, all right? If you do that, you're gonna find out that very big things that would have knocked somebody for a loop, right? Fit inside of you. They're just, yes, people die. Yes, this happens. Yes, people steal. Yes, this happens. Yes, lots of things happen, right? That's reality. Galaxies crash with each other. Supernovas, right? I, I once read, it was amazing, that when, when a big star collapses and blows up into a supernova, the amount of light it gives off, that one star is equivalent to all the light in the entire galaxy. 300 billion stars worth of light glare instantly when that star collapses. There was a red giant collapse. So a supernova is, whoa. That's going on too. That's pretty traumatic. That's pretty major, right? All kinds of things go on in the universe. The question is, does it fit inside of you? Doesn't mean that you're not human, that you don't feel it, right? But does it fit? Are you open enough that it fits? So that's your starting place, right? Now what? Now it's not, I can't deal with it, right? Now it's, this is the process of dealing with it. Of course there's grief. Of course there's a sense of loss. There's a human in there, okay? Do you get along with that human? Do you feel compassion for that human? Or are you, you know, down there wallowing like we talked about? It can go through very quickly then. And it's not cold at all. It's very warm. And you feel the completeness of your loss 
right, becomes part of your being. It fits. It, the key is, it, does it fit inside of you? Because these stages are, no, it doesn't fit, but I can do this much now. And maybe I can do that. And maybe, you follow me? You're just making some more room to let it fit. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Because the whole universe, you are the whole universe. Do you understand that? It's not that can this little thing that comes into your senses. You are the universe. My father and I are one. You're everything. It all fits in you, except that you're limiting it. You know that, right? It's like you hold it back only this far. That's, that's enlightenment. That's what it means to grow and really be open. And you're capable of that. But you, you just work with it. You just work with it. You work with it. So very helpful, Michael. I just, to me personally, and I, and I suspect um, for our audience as well, very much so. And um, I just want to thank you for shedding your light and wisdom on these questions. Well, thank you. Thank you for being as deep as you are. And thank you for all the people you help, right? This is this called the inner work, right? If people will do the inner work, there's not one drop of the effort you put out in this inner work that doesn't stay with you forever. It becomes part of the soul. It's not even, it passes beyond death, okay? You're do, that's your real work, is the inner work. So I hope it helps people, and thank you so much for this opportunity to share with you. Matt and Michael, thank you both so much for this riveting conversation. And Michael, congratulations on the publication of your new book, The Untethered Soul Guided Journal. And to viewers, we hope that all of you watching enjoy this interview and perhaps even found help for any struggles you may be facing as well. Take care all.